Well, I'll say a hello from me to everyone. My name is Mervyn Singer. Um, at the moment, we're not sure if there's anyone out there. So could kindly somebody put in the chat that uh, there is uh, extraterrestrial life? Uh, because <laughs> at the moment we can see the speakers, um, but no one else. And lots of people have registered. Ah, there are lots joining. Oh, brilliant. OK, wonderful. So we are... Uh, we are in touch. Um, OK, so I will begin. My name's Mervyn Singer. I'm delighted to uh, be uh, chairing this webinar that will go on for an hour. Um, for those of you uh, who don't have time to listen to all of it or want to come back to it later or tell your mates, it will be on the video link on the ICS YouTube channel. So please uh, log into that if you want to um, uh, repeat view see it for the first time whatever please uh post questions onto the chat uh the idea is that we have three uh eminent speakers who will talk for about 10 minutes and that will give plenty of time at the end that we'll have a good half hour discussion so we really do need lots and lots of questions uh flooding in from you um they'll be challenging some of the uh current dogma as this is World Sepsis Day, let's see where we are, where we perhaps could be in terms of our sepsis management. And my final comment, I'd like to say a big thank you to Biomeria, who have um, supported this webinar with an educational grant. Oh, I was just told, please put it onto the Q&A section and not the chat. So I apologise on that one. So if you uh, do have uh, questions, please go to uh, the chat. And Katrina's just uh, put up a question, which I'll send back to Rachel, chat disabled. So uh, um, hopefully uh, it will work uh, imminently. But without further ado, while we're just sorting that one out, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Andy Breen, who's a council member of the ICS, uh, head of the uh, learning division of the ICS and he will kindly uh, start us off by challenging the notion that 30 mils per kilo of fluid uh, is not necessary for everybody. Thank you Andy. <laughs> right thank you very much Mervyn for the introduction. Um, what we're trying to do today in uh, uh, to mark World Sepsis Day which was yesterday is have a little look at some of the dogma um, that surrounds some of the recommendations um, and we're looking, uh, well, I'm going to look at IV fluid resuscitation and sepsis and asking the question, is 30 mils per kilo too much fluid? I'd like to explore this in the context of the whole hospital and from a quality improvement perspective, rather than a long systematic review where you see uh, me trying to dissect lots and lots of evidence that we've accrued over the decades. This is about looking at the, the common sense um, of some of these recommendations. And... What we were told in the 2021 iteration of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines is that for patients with sepsis-induced hypoperfusion or septic shock, we suggest at least 30 mils per kilo of, of IV crystalloid given within the first three hours of resuscitation. That's got a low quality of evidence and a weak strength of recommendation. If you're particularly eagle-eyed, you'll know or you'll have spotted that that's a downgrade from what was said in the 2016 guidelines, uh, where that was, instead of we suggest 30 mils a kilo, we recommended 30 mils uh, per kilo at that time. And that had a that came with a strong recommendation rather than a weak one. So why? Why uh, are we being asked to give that amount of fluid rather than some other amount of fluid? So without going through the the years and years of, uh, of evidence accrued on this subject, here's the justification, and it's rational and it's fair. It's a retrospective analysis of adults presenting to emergency departments with sepsis or septic shock. Um, if you look at those patients, the ones who don't get 30 mils per kilo have got a higher chance of dying and they've got worse ICU outcome measures in terms of resolution of hypotension and length of stay. So is that a one size fits all recommendation from the campaign? Are they saying that everybody should have exactly the same treatment? Well, behind these headline recommendations, there is an 81 page 
document in all its glory with a lot more nuance in there. And it recognizes the risks of fluid accumulation and acknowledges the benefits of doing things a little bit more scientifically, using perhaps dynamic measures uh, to help you to titrate your fluid, um, dynamic measures on the ward like a passive leg raise, dynamic measures in the intensive care unit with your cardiac output monitor. And they include specifically um, using fluid boluses against the systolic blood pressure. So anybody can do that. Anybody can titrate fluid against the systolic blood pressure. You don't need a, a cardiac output monitor to do this. But the impression I get from these recommendations is that this should only be after 30 mils of kilo has been given. And I'm not sure that that necessarily makes sense. Are we saying that every patient with septic shock is hypovolemic to the tune of 30 mils per kilo? If your patient isn't preload responsive, should you carry on giving IV fluid boluses until you've reached 30 mils per kilo? Or more broadly, are we asking a question here that says if something isn't working, should you keep doing it? And another question, which can't we can't explore the full physiology of this one in the time that we've got, but it's one worth asking and letting it hang there. Should we give fluid just because somebody is preload responsive? Or is there still a time when we should stop doing that? So thinking about hypovolemia and sepsis, what is the physiological rationale for IV fluids? And a particular question is, does sepsis cause hypovolemia? Um, I'll give you a clue. No, it doesn't cause hypovolemia, but it certainly causes an apparent hypovolemia. It can create a preload responsive patient and an expansion of total volume, as we know, will expand the stressed volume and it is correct to give fluids in these situations and we can do it immediately on site in the emergency department, on site on a, a, an acute hospital ward. It's the right thing to do. Even if a patient isn't hypovolemic, it's certainly uh, the cornerstone of immediate resuscitation for these patients. The guidelines also use this term sepsis induced hypoperfusion, but it's poorly defined in the document. Um, and is open to interpretation by every acute care provider who might be dealing with septic patients. And they might look at lactate or oliguria or acidosis of evidence of sepsis-induced hypoperfusion. And frequently, as we know, people will directly link these things to hypovolemia. And if we were to give everybody with a high lactate or a low urine output or an acidosis, 30 mils per kilo, and indulge in that practice of trying to chase down the lactate or chase up the urine output or sort out the acidosis by titrating fluid against these markers, you can see that many of these patients will not be hypovolemic, might well be uh, at risk of harm. We're certainly exposing patients to the risk of harm from excessive fluids, from fluid overload. Which brings us to the question of when we should stop giving fluids. Um, and linked to that is when we should start giving pressors. And it's the introduction of some very established physiological concepts that caught my eye in the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines 2021. They mentioned for the first time the concept of the mean systemic filling pressure. Now, lots of you will probably still have a copy of Guyton's physiology on a shelf somewhere. And Arthur Guyton established the concept of the mean systemic filling pressure in 1955 after a series of uh, very interesting animal experiments. And there is mention in the guidelines about the effect of pressors on the mean systemic filling pressure, but very much an emphasis on the left-hand side of the circulation, on arterial blood pressure, um, rather than the potentially more important work, uh, effect of pressors on the venous system. By increasing the mean systemic filling pressure, we increase venous return and we reduce transcapillary flow, what we frequently uh, might refer to as leaky capillaries. Uh, we can attenuate uh, that and improve venous return. And in patients who are not responding to fluids, and even the ones who are only transiently responding to fluids, it makes physiological sense to start pressors earlier. And there's some data suggesting that this is a good thing. Um, a nice sepsis study from Thailand uh, last year 
um, which probably gave rise to this one that I'm sure many of you saw earlier on in the year, looking at early restrictive or liberal fluid management for sepsis-induced hypotension. Now, the restrictive group here got early vasopressors, and I'm viewing this as an early vasopressor study. The conclusion from this was that it didn't look like it made an enormous difference using an early restrictive and vasopressor approach versus liberal fluid management, but um, both groups were very well protocolized and there was no usual care group. Now, when I go out on my ICU outreach ward rounds, I will be asked to see septic patients and usual care can frequently mean we've given five litres, we've given seven litres, we've given nine litres of fluid and we get a little bit of uh, an improvement and then things lag back again, but we just carried on. So I wouldn't expect that this study would uh, show a difference against um, a well protocolized care, but it might well, the same approach might well show a good difference against what I think is possibly usual care in a lot of settings. It's not fully, rec it's not recommended um, in the 2021 guidelines very overtly, but in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign bundle guidelines, we are recommended to apply vasopressors if the patient is hypotensive, not just after the fluid resuscitation, but during the fluid resuscitation. So this is recommended in the most recent hour one bundle. And I think it makes good physiological sense um, and it will protect patients from being exposed to the risk of too much intravenous fluid. So we're left with a choice. Is it 30 mils per kilo for everyone or is it individualized therapy? And I want to emphasize, I fully support the content of the surviving sepsis guidelines because they are clearly espousing um, the benefits of individualizing therapy wherever possible. If we can give individualized IV fluid resuscitation and resources are, yeah, it takes a lot of resource to do that, um, then I'm sure that we're doing a better job than a one size fits all. Um, but can your hospital provide it? Is there a hospital wide IV fluid training in place for all acute staff in your hospital? Do you have an IV fluid stewardship group in your hospital? Do you know the name of your intravenous fluid lead who will lead policy and keep you up to date with that kind of thing? And can you provide early admission to your ICU for pressors when they're no longer preload responsive? Can you get all of those patients in? And if the answer is no to those, then the recommendation of at least 30 mils per kilo is a correct recommendation. It will correct hypotension in a great many more patients. On balance, it will do more harm than good. It will improve outcomes overall. And there might be some occult harm from volume overload. Very difficult to measure, but I strongly suspect it's out there. But what happens after that 30 mils per kilo is really important. Now, every single one of us enjoys a really good response to a fluid challenge. It gives me a, a warm feeling inside. It makes me smile. I like it when a patient responds well to fluid. But at the same time, we repeat that and we start seeing that the response is less good than it was before. And to borrow someone else's catchphrase, when the fun stops, stop. I think that we need to be more vocal about the dangers of over transfusing fluid once we've stopped seeing a response. So the answer to my question, is 30 mils per kilo too much? Probably not, but applying vasopressors during or after resuscitation is in line with surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. It's in line with uh, NICE 174 clinical guideline on intravenous fluids, and that will help maintain hemodynamic goals and I'm sure help us to improve outcomes. I'll stop there and hand you back to Mervyn. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very, very much, Adia. It was a great talk. Thank you. So from the great Andy to uh, the wonderful Julian, Beyond, uh, Julian Professor of Intensive Care at Birmingham, and uh, very well known, uh, I'm sure, to all of you. And uh, Julian was uh, the chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Um, there's a position statement on early antibiotics in sepsis, and uh, he will talk us through how aggressive uh, should the timing be. Julian, thank you very much. Thank you, Mervyn. <clears throat> and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see 
um, some good friends and distinguished individuals on the on the call. Can you see these slides? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you very much. So, a little way, just in a, a by way of a, a little bit of background, there are lots of ways one can come at sepsis, and this is one of the issues we had to think about in that working group. It has been at one time or another, and usually all of these all at once, um, a taxonomic problem in terms of description, uh, a public health problem in terms of <clears throat> disease impact and me measuring uh, the incidence. It's certainly been a pathophysiological problem, and Andy has demonstrated some of that, um, but of course it goes all the way through to silver bullets. It's extraordinary to me to think that Elizabeth Siegler's paper on centoxin is now 32 years old. Um, but in terms of uh, things like the surviving sepsis campaign, uh, it was really the patient safety agenda, um, which appeared in 2000 onwards, that gave this legs. And <clears throat> sepsis then became framed in part as a practitioner reliability problem, which could be dealt with by the use of care bundles. And now more recently, we have to think about it in terms of antibiotic resistance and antibi antibiotic uh, stewardship. As far as timing of administration of antimicrobials is concerned, this has evolved over time, um, beginning with the surviving sepsis campaign. And I can remember these early discussions. I was a I was part of the surviving sepsis campaign from 2006 onwards. And I remember thinking, why do we have to argue about when to give antibiotics? We should just be giving them as early as possible. And that was, of course, um, both correct and naively wrong. And the um, guidance has evolved. So um, if we come through to the surviving sepsis campaign 2001, then uh, there's still a recommendation for within one hour of rec recognition for septic shock, but it also includes this high likelihood for sepsis. And I'm not quite sure what that is. It's been toned down for septis sepsis without shock and indeed um, for a low likelihood of infection, as you would hope. And the Infectious Disease Society of America chimed in starting in 2018 with some uh, cogent reasons why this could be problematic. And then Mervyn uh, provided an additional entertaining and, and thought-provoking uh, publication in The Lancet the following year. So what are the problems of the one-hour mandate? Well, first, I, I think I put first uh, the issue of time zero. It doesn't need unpackaging for this particular audience. Um, the diagnosis of sepsis <clears throat> and indeed the underlying cause um, is always uncertain in the early stages. We have a choice of measures of severity or urgency or risk, if you prefer. So the question is which one to use. The focus on the one hour can certainly distort clinical priorities, and it may add unnecessarily to clinical workload. And there's an opportunity cost in a resource limited system by doing that. Then there's the failure to de-escalate and the problems associated with prolonged um, antimicrobials, particularly if they're the wrong ones leading to multi-drug resistance. The other big challenge we've had has been in the interpretation of the research evidence, much of which being um, uh, retrospective and observational has methodological difficulties attached, which include inadequate adjustment for confounders, the assumption that the mortality risk is constant over time, um, which of course is definitely not the case, Information from secular trend studies is very likely to be biased because over time, a larger proportion of lower risk patients get included, which may then look like an improvement with therapy. Uh, they can, with, with single databases, they can be biased towards the inclusion of sicker patients. And that means that the information from those sicker patients can be extrapolated to the non-shock population. And there have now been um, at least three, and Mervyn will correct me on this, but at least three well-conducted prospective studies 
which show that there is a benefit <clears throat> for timely antimicrobials in septic shock, but for non-shock sepsis, there's a much longer window of opportunity to think about the problem. So by, um, with that by way of background, um, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine uh, stimulated the Academy, of which it's a member, um, to approve setting up uh, a working group to look at the issue of when uh, best to administer antimicrobial agents in sepsis. And um, I was asked to chair this um, with Mervyn as, as uh, co-chair. We were supported by this very excellent um, team of individuals, Matt uh, in particular providing his uh, guidance on news scoring. And all the, um, the all those colleges and faculties that wish to participate could do so, and they're represented uh, in this group. The work started in January 2020, um, and then, of course, um, we were struck with the pandemic um, and conducted the rest of our work remotely. We produced the final guidance in May 2022 and published it. And then there was a loud squawk from general practice and then an even louder squawk from the surgeons who discovered that they hadn't joined in at the beginning and now wished they had. So we had a task to um, revise the guidance in order to try and keep them on board. And rather to my surprise, in the end, we were successful. So um, I'll just present, um, first of all, our guiding principles and then the output. So the guiding principles were that whatever decision support tool we would come up with, it needed to follow clinical thought processes. And for that, we don't begin with, is the patient septic? We begin with, is the patient sick? The second is that treatment priority needed to be based on how sick the patient was. And whatever measure we used for that, it needed to be location and disease independent and preferably widely adopted and validated. The other principles, I think, are uh, self-evident. There were three tools we could use for severity uh, or urgency. Sepsis-3, um, an admirable tool, but it's um, developed in a septic population. The NICE guidance, um, uh, the perfectly reasonable table and based on um, uh, physiology, but not directly linked to news. Whereas news has been adopted by the Royal College of Physicians, widely used in every hospital in the country, and there's a reasonable evidence base to go with it. And it, it is, it's generic, it's not just for sepsis. So that's the one we went for. So we've ended up with this framework. Um, this is not the decision tool, because you can take this guidance and then adapt it to whatever format you wish to use in local hospitals. But it begins with the physiology, physiology first. And we've used these severity bands after a great deal of discussion, because once again, there's an evidence base attaching to it in terms of severity of outcomes. We've then got three phases. The first is the initial assessment of the patient. The second is the actions pertaining to that initial assessment. And then the third is, could this patient be infected? So for the first bit, it's standard stuff. Every medical student learns it. History, examination, lab results, and then a consideration of uh, chronic health, comorbid disease, frailty, patient preferences. For the actions that follow, monitoring, when to escalate, and treatment of the precipitating condition, which initially will be largely physiology based. And then we had three categories for likelihood of infection, unlikely, possible, and probable or definite. As far as the first bit's concerned, we wanted to make sure that clinicians had freedom to exercise sensible clinical judgment. And therefore, the new score alone is, although important, insufficient. So we've included here that if there's 
clinician concern, carer concern of that's useful and informative, if the patient's deteriorating, if there's surgically remediable sepsis, if the patient's neutropenic or there are other lab uh, evidence um, of severity of illness, then the actions attaching to these news bands should be upgraded to the next news level. So if you've got somebody coming in with, with a news score on first measurement between one to four, but you're worried about them, you can park them in the five to six band and so on. Very important is considering these aspects of chronic health and preferences for treatment, which will likely influence the care pathway and that needs to be made clear in any performance uh, assessment. For patients who have no physiological abnormality and standard care applies, and if they're potentially infected, um, then the diagnostic tests and the treatment plan need to be formulated within six hours. With a new score of one to four, there should be a registered nurse review within one hour observations put in place four to six hourly and um, attention to the patient and their management needs to be escalated if they're not getting better. The underlying problems need to be dealt with or focused on at least within the six hour period. A five to six news score, these patients are sicker, they have hourly observations, need to be reviewed within one hour by, as we say, a clinician competent in acute illness assessment. Now that could be um, a physician associate, if it's somebody trained in, in that work. It's the competence that's important rather than the label. And again, escalate if the patient's not improving. And the underlying condition needs to have been, uh, the treatment needs to be started within a three hour period. A seven or more, <clears throat> observations every 30 minutes, review within 30 minutes, escalation to a senior doctor within one hour. That could be a registrar or a consultant and refer to outreach or intensive care. That's got to be done within an hour. If infection is unlikely to be the, the driving cause, then um, there's daily review of infection status. Lowest level of severity, a six hour window for undertaking necessary tests and deciding whether or not to start antibiotics. Five to six, a three hour window for um, administering antimicrobials, not just prescribing, administering and planning source identification and control. And then having initiated source control within six hours. And for the sickest level, within one hour for administering antimicrobials, three hour window for source identification, up to six for source control and review of antimicrobials in all cases within a two to three hour window. For children, the main difference here is that the PUSE score um, values are slightly different. And the other is that there's a bypass mechanism to escalate uh, management to the most severe level if the child looks ill. Don't waste time doing a lot of other things. So um, we feel that this is um, a pragmatic set of uh, guidelines. It's got universal professional support. Um, I hope you um, will agree with me that that's not always a usual uh, phenomenon, but we managed it. Um, the guidance is currently being evaluated by NICE um, for a rapid review of NICE Guidance 51, and we're not in a position to give you the outcome, but we do know that um, they have smiled on it. Uh, in terms of further work, I think this deserves research evaluation, and um, that would be supported by um, the specialty group for critical care within the NIHR. We'd also like to see it incorporated in local decision support tools. The framework itself is not really a decision support tool. Um, just talking you through it, you can see that it requires a bit of thought. So we'd like to see people develop 
um, their own versions of it, share them, and then see whether it's possible to come up with uh, perhaps one universal approach. So I'll end there. And thank you very much for listening. Julian, that was a lovely talk. Thank you very much indeed. And without further ado, our uh, final speaker is the lovely Julia Wendon, Professor of Intensive Care at um, the King's King's Liver Unit. Um, she's also been Medical Director at King's, Medical Director at the London Clinic. And obviously, who better to talk to us today than about lactate? How necessary? Jules, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. Can you hear me and see the slides? I tell you what, while we're waiting for Jules to come back, um, I'll, I'll throw a question or two at uh, Andy and Julian. And please, anyone online, on the Q&A bit of uh, Zoom, please uh, do put in your questions. Uh, and then we'll continue question time when Jules uh, gets on and finishes her talk. Um, Julian, well, um, in the surviving sepsis uh, thing it's very much sepsis and septic shock which is a bit of a sort of artificial division whereas um, with news 2 there's this sort of continuum of increasing severity um, do you want to have a quick few words on those as to why news 2 you think is more appropriate than sepsis and septic shock for jumping in we often um, conceptualize life in, in a binary manner somebody's good or bad somebody's well or sick, yeah. somebody's septic or not septic. <clears throat> to some extent, the extremes are easy, but actually we spend most of our lives messing about in the middle. And the current surviving sepsis campaign guidance, I think, demonstrates some of the confusion of thought in that respect, because the guidance is still predicated on starting with the uh, knowledge that a patient is septic, but in the real world, you don't know that. You start off with a patient who's ill. And that's why I think the system we've proposed is such a strong one. It provides gradation of risk, and it doesn't make the assumption that you know the patient's septic from the start. Lovely. Jules just uh, messaged me saying her computer had crashed, so she is having to reboot it. But yeah, so hopefully she'll join us soon. But we'll carry on with questions. Uh, Andy, um. You were talking, obviously, to try and get presses in earlier. Uh, if the patient's hypotensive, etc., you don't necessarily need to wait till they've been drowned with fluid um, before uh, then thinking, oh, let's put in a presser. What's your view on peripheral vasopressors? So that can be started in the emergency department without going getting a central line put in. Um, so, as you know, there's been... Um, endorsement of this approach uh, nationally. The Intensive Care Society um, has, uh, has has endorsed uh, the use of uh, peripheral pressors and the safety of peripheral pressors. Um, I do still feel personally that their principal use is to get pressors in early whilst you find uh, a way of getting uh, central access. And now that is through personal preference rather than through evidence, but having seen an extravasation injury that uh, was nothing short of disfiguring for a young patient who uh, was having blood pressure support for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, it left me wondering how many of those is an acceptable number. Um, and it's, it's difficult. We can see that probably many, many people will have benefited from early peripheral vasopressors, um, but I think it's very difficult to look that one patient in the eye that got very, very clear harm and ended up with needing uh, surgery, skin grafting, an anaesthetic patch on their arm, um, to say that we shouldn't at least minimise the time during which peripheral vasopressors are in use. Yeah, as a personal uh, comment from me completely agree it's so it's good as a temporizing measure but uh yeah um perhaps uh central is generally safer um jules uh has back come back on jules can you see if you can share your screen and then uh after your talk we'll come back to questions so intimidating following the two previous speakers um superb talks and then i crashed my computer so i love lactate but sometimes i think can people just stop measuring it and giving fluid? 
And maybe that is actually the main message out of this talk. So it is a really useful measure, but sometimes it results in the wrong actions from it. And as previous speakers have noted, the Surviving Sepsis Guidance 2021 for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest guiding resuscitation to decrease serum lactate in patients with an elevated lactate over not using lactate at all. And that's probably reasonable. But let's just sort of dig into some of the old data and some of the new data and see what we can tease out of that. Are the slides moving forward, Mervyn? Yes, they are. Super. So if a lactate is high, it tells me something's am amiss, but it sure as heck doesn't tell me what that is. And it is a compound which is not greatly responsive to interventions in a time sensitive manner. So a couple of hours is really the minimal that you can expect a delta change. And it almost always results in that spinal reflex of high lactate, underfilled, more fluid, more fluid without that common sense that Andy referred to early on. Does low mean they're okay? No, it doesn't. And it certainly doesn't mean they're not septic. All of that personal view, little data to support it. So in terms of our measured lactate, um, it's a balance of clearly of production and of clearance. And we need to recognize that the production of lactate in our bodies is high. And therefore pulling in 500 mils of ringer's lactate isn't gonna really affect things. You can see there on the slide where it's produced from and it's metabolized in the liver and the kidney and the heart can actually use it as fuel. If you want to look at a really good review on lactate metabolism, prior misinterpretations and current understanding, I commend you the article by Brian Ferguson, really excellent article in terms of lactate metabolism. So what are the causes of an elevated lactate? And it isn't always sepsis. We've heard about that great phrase, tissue hypo hypoperfusion, tissue hypoxia. That might be under perfusion, but it might be other causes. And that source of lactate can be regional, global, or indeed exertional. And we know what hypoxia does to the mitochondria. But it could also be a disease process. It could be lymphoma, diffuse malignancy, DKA, alcoholic ketosis, liver or renal failure, and also aerobic glycolysis, commonly seen in our septic patients, and as beautifully demonstrated uh, by Bruno Levy um, and also uh, Mervyn's work. Various drugs can cause hyperlactatemia, often not considered paracetamol, if you've got very high levels, really shoves your lactate up. Metformin, linezolid, the beta agonists, the alcohols, and of course, rarer, the congenital areas of metabolism. If we go to the old data, you can see very clearly that having a high lactate is not associated with a good outcome. That does not mean that driving it down necessarily improves your outcome, however. But this nice work from John Kellum's group showing that a high lactate as a cause of metabolic acidosis was more important in terms of mortality than other causes of metabolic acidosis. And this data similarly showing that shock and elevated lactate is associated with a significant mortality. And in the table on the right, split into less than 1.9, the intermediate group and the high group greater than four, and a very clear relationship. This data I find fascinating because it really draws out that message that lactate alone is really not greatly useful. If you look at the bottom gra graphic, you can see this high mortality associated with a blood glucose of less than seven and a lactate of greater than 2.3. You then go down again on your mortality and up again once your glucose goes above nine and also your lactate remains above 2.3. So the interconnection of various parameters is important Important. And it comes down to that, what we should all be doing, multimodality monitoring of our patients. So the data then that started looking at different types of resuscitation, comparing central venous uh, saturation with lactate clearance back in 2010, showing very clearly that actually additional 
attempts to normalize lactate clearance compared with normalizing SCVO2 didn't offer benefit. So let's not do too much. Let's do just enough, but not too much. And that really brings us on to the Andromeda data much more recently, looking at patients randomized to a step-by-step -step resuscitation pro protocol, either normalizing capillary refill time or decreasing lactate, ideally at a rate of 20% per two hours over an eight hour intervention period. And you can see that compared to the two, there was no significant difference in 28 all day mortality. And this is shown on that table from that paper, which I'm sure is well known to all of you with a p-value of 0.06. So just approaching something that might be important and the amount of resuscitation fluid, again, important over the first eight hours um, and hitting significance. And if you look at it on a Kaplan-Meier, again, you see that trend, but not significant for the chasing of lactate versus peripheral perfusion as your endpoint of resuscitation. And again, no real difference whether you look at a lactate of four or a lactate decrease. Again, there is always this trend to actually a favoring of peripheral perfusion over lactate clearance. So suggesting that lactate is useful, but it's not the be all and end all, and we shouldn't uh, really bet the uh, whole shop on it. So similarly, this paper coming out after Andromeda, smaller, clearly, um, but similar sort of endpoints, but showing that capillary um, refill time targeted resuscitation was not superior to lactate. You got a faster achievement of your predefined resus target. And uh, importantly, perhaps, stopping fluids with a capillary refill time of less than three seconds is safe in terms of tissue perfusion. So we then go into some of the uh, post hoc analysis of the Andromeda shock study, and it really begins to pull out some interesting data. Sepsis three for all of the questions you might raise, but that was the entry criteria and going into the capillary refill time or the lactate normalization limb or clearance limb. And if you look at this, getting to your normal capillary refill time, a 23% mortality. But the lactate group, if you've got a normal capillary refill time and you're in the lactate group and you've got a normal lactate, you've got a much higher mortality. And if you've got an abnormal lactate, an even higher mortality. And this is further analyzed here. And it's a busy slide for which I apologize. But the bits that I really want to draw attention to are if you get to your normal capillary refill time, and you hold, you're not giving more fluids, then you've got about a 19% mortality. If you've got an abnormal capillary refill time that we don't manage to correct, you've got a high mortality as predicted at 56%. And that is the same mortality as your lactate group who continue to have abnormal capillary refill time. But perhaps what I'd like to draw out is this group with an abnormal lactate, but with a normal capillary refill time, who we are probably still giving fluid to, who have a significantly increased mortality at 32%. So if your lactate's high, but you've got a normal cap refill, fluids are possibly detrimental. And that brings us on to how we should be thinking and timing of lactate, that delta lactate during the salvage and the initial optimization, perhaps in that first 24 hours is useful, but after that, come back, start considering capillary refill time, mixed venous saturation, CO2 gap to assess whether you do or don't need fluids. So this nice review by Jean-Louis Vincent and Jean de Bacca, Lactate concentrations are increased in our sick patients and they're associated with a high mortality. Changes are balanced by production and uptake and metabolism. A warning sign of something wrong. Decrease suggests improvement, but you never base it on one variable alone. And serial lactate is a bit slow to really drive management. So again, coming back to the beginning, what's my personal anecdote? It's less than two, doesn't exclude sepsis or sickness. 
greater than two, covert sepsis or other causes, greater than four, real concern. Look at your delta change to interventions, but also consider the other parameters. Recognize the role of lactate as a challenge test to your metabolic capacity. And please, no knee-jerk response to high lactate, more fluid. Thank you for your attention. Lovely. That was a lovely talk. So uh, can I have all three speakers uh, on visual? Thank you. Uh, Julian's there. Andy is joined and Julia's going to join. Could be there. No, I can't see you. Ah, there, now we can see your face. Lovely. That's beautiful. Thank you. Three great talks and um, lots of questions are coming in. I see Julian's already answered uh, a few in the chat, but what we'll do is we'll perhaps um, uh, just to touch on them again. And can I suggest all three speakers do feel free to uh, butt in as you see appropriate. Um, I, I was interested to note, Julian, that a couple of the uh, questions that you've already answered in the chat session or the answer Q&A uh, section uh, touched on Martha's rule and uh, the relevance of a, an anxious carer, parent, relative, whatever. Do, do you want to uh, just re-rehearse that uh, discussion? Um, apologies, by the way, if I jumped in <clears throat> too rapidly on, on replying. I had a, a couple of friends dial in, so uh, and then it it just continued, so excuse me. Um, well, a, a, a decision support tool need not necessarily just be for medical staff. It's for nursing staff as well. Um, and by extension, why not those who know the patient better than anyone else, the relatives? So I, I, I'm <clears throat> rather a fan of shared care approaches. I appreciate that they're sometimes difficult, um, but more usually than not, I, I've, I've found things work better if you spend time with the family, and certainly I feel better about it. Yeah, um, it the question is how and why, and that's more difficult and probably lies outside the confines of this, this discussion. Um, but if you've got um, evidence <clears throat> that a patient is not getting better, and they fall into a category where escalation is required, then that's a second opinion. And I think you should get on with it. Lovely. Andy, Jules, anything you want to add to that? So I'd absolutely agree with that. I, I you know, I really like the idea of family patient anxiety, concern, driving some of our attention to the patient. If someone feels anxious, they're adrenalized, they're unwell. There is something to say there's something not right. We might not have measured it yet. We might not know what it is, but I think that engagement and that review is really important. Lovely. And I would completely support that as well. What we saw with the case of, uh, of Martha was a case of, uh, was it sepsis? Was it more pancreatitis? Can we ask somebody else? And intensive care weren't called. I think that intensive care might well be the specialty that is that second opinion um, as a result of uh, the implementation of Martha's law. And we'll have to find a way of delivering that uh, because then there could be quite a lot for us to do there. But undoubtedly, uh, we'll, we'll do good. I've seen evidence quoted from Australia that they believe lives have been saved by a similar intervention. So once we're told what it will look like, uh, I don't doubt that our learned societies will, will support it and, and tell us how to implement it. One of the... Uh the uh, well, a very common thread through all each of your talks was physiology whether it's uh looking at a fluid challenge looking at the response looking at uh, uh capillary refill time julian looking at new score and physiology um and it's a personal fear of mine that the eyes are being diverted towards uh computer screens away from the patient rather than looking at the patient any comments uh, but, um, <laughs> um, just to 
check your are you concerned that the interest in physiology is guiding us towards the computer screen or uh the evolution of more computer systems is guiding us towards the computer screen yeah. um because my uh, i i think that understanding the physiology whilst you're at the bedside uh, makes such a difference and my trainees in my hospital will know that this is something i go on about over and over again that if something um isn't working it's okay to actually do nothing rather than do something and it's the it's the the cognitive dissonance that comes between wanting to do something and the physiology telling you that it might not be the right thing to do that that we need to overcome in these situations julia spoke about lactate eliciting a spinal reflex of fluid fluid and fluid um and i i think i think we all see that all the time and just stepping back and thinking about the physiology of where the lactate came from and by what mechanism some intravenous fluid might help with that will make it more comfortable for us to not carry on down the wrong road of repeated response. Jules, he wanted to come in. I mean, I, I think like you, Mervyn, you know, I like being at the bedside. I think we all like being at the bedside. We like being with patients, we like being with families, we like looking at the impact that our interventions make, be they positive, I love that description of a positive fluid challenge, um, be they neutral or be they negative so that we can remedy it. Too often, I fear on our computer systems, we look at one hourly data that's uploaded and you miss that physiological variation. So yeah, absolutely. Julian, you anything? Uh, to add, or shall I move on? Physiology is fundamental, but it's only part of the story. I think everything begins with the patient. Like Jules, there's nothing to substitute for being there by the bedside. Hold the patient's hand, see how they feel, talk to them, and listen to the relatives. A, a very solid vote there for the, the bedside. Um, Lorraine asked a question about... Are you talking about central capillary refill time? And you said, yes, indeed, Jules. What do you mean by central? Could you just, in case people... Uh, uh, for capillary, aiming for capillary refill time as you assess it at the bedside of less than three seconds. Yeah. But is that by central? But do you mean like yeah. squeezing a fingernail? Yes, the, the standard measures for sta central venous, central appropriate. You know, I could, you couldn't do capillary refill time on my fingers, I get Raynaud's. It would be useless. <laughs> so it's again, it's assessing your patient appropriately to your clinical context. Indeed, I'll buy you some gloves uh, <laughs> for the next time. Uh, Andy, um, there's a fluid question. Um, the rule for fluids and presses are the least we can get away with, much like other interventions. So, is it like a, a the sweet spot that we need to try and get to? Well, I'm not sure that I completely agree when. If, if it's the least presser we can get away with, because we have a um, a habit of seeing if we can get them off the pressers. Um, and normally that means seeing if we can turn the noradrenaline down by giving more fluid. Um, so yes, there's a sweet spot there of the right amount of both. And I don't think as a uh, profession or the, the world of physiology, I don't think we'll ever be able to completely agree on what is that exact sweet spot. Again, we're back to the bedside and making the very best judgments that we can for the patient in front of us. But yes, there is a practice of either seeing if we can get the pressers off or, or also trying to keep them out of ICU. We might hear a uh, an outreach nurse tell us, I'll, I'll keep them out of ICU. And that might be through giving more fluids uh, when it might not be the right thing to do. Um, but, and I've had this raised when I've been making this point before, have we got the resource to admit every single patient that's currently getting too much fluids into the intensive care unit for pressers? Probably not, but uh, I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know what that unmet need is. Right. Uh, well, we've got time for one final question, which I, I think actually is an interesting discussion point. Is point of care ultrasound going to become our monitor of choice for resuscitation endpoints? So I'll, I'll ask uh, our panellists what they think and actually whether a, a, a monitor is an appropriate word to apply to POCUS rather than a diagnostic tool. Uh, who wants to go first? Happy to start. Um, okay. 
so obviously a, a monitor is continuous um a measurement is intermittent and i think that pocus is doing things intermittently for us but we can repeat them um i've been in discussions where one person has defied another person to tell them how an echocardiogram can truly elicit hypovolemia um, and it's an interesting question uh, because the things that we call hypovolemia on echocardiogram for example um, are potentially uh, the, the changes that we see with um, vasodilatation the two things can look identical on an echocardiogram we've tried to address this uh, when um, putting together the Fusic HD uh, module um, we spend more time looking at organ congestion now with ultrasound than we ever did and lung ultrasound is helping us to understand when we've gone too far with fluids um, personally I don't think that it will be the single modality that solves all of our problems but undoubtedly it helps us get to the nub of the problem a lot more quickly than ever than than we ever could without it. Jules, Julian, do you want to add anything from your perspective? And his reply is, is admirably succinct. Lovely. I, I think, think it, uh... yeah, it's two o'clock, so there are more questions, but I'm afraid I'll have to draw it to a close. I'm, I'm going to say thank you very, very much indeed to our three speakers. Uh, thank you to uh, Bio Mary again for their... Uh, educational grant to support this webinar and uh, the ICS for putting it on and thank you all for uh, joining and uh, listening in and for your questions have a lovely afternoon thanks Mervyn. bye bye, -bye.